Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mike O'Brien. I'm with a company called Aperio, and I'm joined on stage today by Adam Graff from Genentech and Matt Pruden, who is also from Aperio. And we are thrilled that you've joined us today for this Google I.O. 2010 enterprise session called Extending Google Apps. And what we're going to do in this session is we're going to go beyond the typical Google Apps sort of an implementation of migrating a customer off of Exchange or migrating a customer uh, off of Lotus Notes and explore what it really means to extend the platform. Specifically, we're going to look at three demos, three applications developed by Aperio and by Genentech, and we're going to look under the covers. We're going to look at the code in the API that enabled these apps to come together. We're also going to look at the business benefits that Genentech is deriving as a result of these apps. We'll also take a look at a very cool new Gmail contextual gadget called PS Connect, uh, recently developed by Aperio. And of course, we'll save some time for uh, Q&A at the end. But before we get into all these topics, we'd like to give you a little bit of background on uh, both Aperio and Genentech, who we are, what we're all about, so you kind of sense how we approach these topics. So let's start there. Aperio was founded about uh, three and a half, almost four years ago, with a very singular focus of helping customers move to the cloud. You could think of us as a cloud solution provider, whereby we provide both products and services to help customers implement on Google, on Salesforce, and on Amazon. You know, when we started the company, we said, hey, let's not only do this for our customers, but let's do it for ourselves. So today, we're a company of over 200 employees. We're in 28 different states. We're in three different countries. And we don't own a single server. We own lots of laptops. We even have some iPads, but no servers. About 80% of our infrastructure is on the back of Google, providing our messaging and collaboration layer, and Salesforce providing our application and platform layer. Specifically from a, a Google pers perspective, we were fortunate to become a Google Apps Enterprise partner in May of 2007. And as such, we've had the opportunity to work with literally dozens and dozens of medium and large enterprise customers who have gone Google. In fact, we've participated in six of the 10 largest implementations to date, those customers you see here on this slide. But in addition to those customers who have gone Google, we've also had the opportunity to work with a number of cutting edge, very innovative customers like Genentech, who have truly extended the platform, who have taken advantage of the incredibly rich and robust APIs that Google has made available and have customized Google Apps in a way that better conforms to their business processes. So to those points, I'd like to invite Adam and Matt to jump in here. Adam, to provide a bit of background on Genentech and to share with us these three very cool demos. Great. Thanks, Mike. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Adam Graff, and I manage a very talented team of software developers and engineers at Genentech who are focused on collaboration tools and mobile applications within our enterprise. And so just to give you an idea of who Genentech is, in case you don't know, um, Genentech was founded in 1976 by uh, Herb Boyer and Bob Swanson and as the first biotechnology company in the world. Um, over the years uh, since our founding, we've had a lot of great successes um, from our first uh, cloned human growth hormone drug to the latest blockbusters uh, which deal in the oncology space, Avastin, Rituxan, and, and Herceptin. So oftentimes people ask, uh, ask me or ask Genentech employees, what motivates you guys to get up in the morning and go to work? And the main thing that motivates us as a company and as a whole, and I think you could ask any Genentech employee this question, it's the patience. So focusing in on making sure that we are always uh, identifying how our work ties into the quality of products that we're delivering and the lives that we're saving through our drugs. So how does that relate to IT? Uh, IT embraces this in many ways, and the service that we provide to our end users is an enabling and academic and computing environment. And so what this means is we give as much room as we can to our users to be able to choose the platforms they want to be on, to, cho to choose the tools that they want to work with, and most importantly, give back as much time as we possibly can through IT and not make things more complicated than they should be. So uh, just to give you an idea of our environment, um, to paint a story for you, we've got about 40% of our users on Macs. We have about 60% of our users on PCs. We've got iPhones. We've got Blackberries. We've got a handful of Androids out there. So it's a, it's a pretty uh, mixed environment that we have to support. And so 
um, we do whatever it takes, basically, to support scientific innovation. So putting that into perspective, um, to give you an idea of where we are with Google Apps and kind of where we've come from over the last year and a half, uh, back in 2008, we realized that we had a, a big problem on our hands to deal with in our email infrastructure and calendaring infrastructure. So we started looking at different vendors in the space to figure out what we were going to do to fix the problem. And of course, since we have such a wide variety of platforms that we have to support, whatever we implemented have, had to be able to support that. And that's where Google came into the picture. Um, by enabling us to go to the web, it got us out of the space of having to have thick clients that were dedicated to Windows or uh, like Apple Mail or Outlook um, and so on and so forth. And so once we, uh, we came on board with uh, Google initially with Google Calendar first, we got through that, uh, migrated off of our existing system into the cloud, and currently we're actually implementing Gmail. So we're migrating about 17,000 users over the course uh, of the next six months to the platform. So one of the great things that uh, we realized once we started using Google is that you can think of it as a platform to be extended. Something, it's something bigger than just the products themselves. So when we started to, to think about this uh, and, and spent some time with it to figure out, okay, what can we do in terms of developing small tools that enable our users to do unique things, integrate between legacy applications. So, uh, you know, for example, keep people in one user interface, Gmail, for example, instead of having to flip around between different applications to get the information that they're looking for. And so with Aperio, one of the first projects that we took a look at uh, was, uh, was this, Glenda. And Glenda is a GTalk bot, so as soon as Google released XMPP support in App Engine, we immediately uh, glommed on to that. We'd had this idea in the back of our heads for a while. Um, so it's a GTalk bot that basically lives in the Gmail interface and from a very high level answers questions. Um, so let me paint a picture for you. So I'm, a, I'm sitting at my desk writing an email message and I realize in the middle of that email message, this is way too complex, I don't want to send an email message, I actually want to call the person. So what you would normally do as an end user is open up a new browser or a tab, go to the corporate directory, look up that person's information, and then pick up the phone and call. With Glinda, we can actually ask her, who is John Doe? And she will answer back with that contact information that comes from our corporate directory right in GTalk. So you no longer have to leave Gmail to go find that information. And that's what we've tried to do with all of these, all of these different questions that, that we've set her up to answer. So you can search for information that integrates with our Google Search Appliance infrastructure that's internal to Genentech as well as Google Search. Uh, you can ask who is, of course, to get the corporate directory information. You can ask where is, and that integrates with Google Calendar to reply back what meeting that person may be in at that time. And then, just for fun, we threw in a magic eight ball question uh, for our users. And so, um, I'll turn it over to Matt now, and he'll tell you kind of what's on the back end that enable us to do this. Thanks, Adam. Okay, so let's actually flip over here and talk to Glenda. Let's see if I can bump up the font a little bit so we can see it. Okay, so, you know, hello, Glenda. Obviously, Glenda is going out. She's going to respond to us. We can ask her questions. Um, I'm not real sure where I am right now, so let's just check on me here. Where is Matthew here? And Glenda's going to go out. It's going to look at my Google Calendar. It's going to say, well, I'm in a meeting. I'm giving a demo at Google I.O. So, okay, well, what is this Google I.O. thing? Glenda's going to go out and search. It's going to say, oh, well, Google I.O. according to Google. If I click this link, it'll tell me all about it. So that's a, a real simple demo of, of how this works. And, and the whole idea here is that this is supposed to be fun, right? It's supposed to be uh, uh, interesting and catch on. So let's just try one more thing while I'm here. Let's try the magic eight. Let's pick on Mike here. Will Mike's demo that he's going to give in a minute succeed? Yes. Good job, Mike. That bribe worked. All right. So let's go behind the scenes, see how this works. Okay. Uh, 
obviously we know this is an app engine. Uh, Adam said this earlier, but you know, did we have to go out and, and I don't know, look at 10 different XMPP libraries? No, you know, did we have to go to some enterprise architecture review board and get them to buy in and say, yes, this passes our security audits and all that? And no, we didn't have to do any of that. Uh, and that's because there's already a great high level abstraction to do XMPP right out of the box in App Engine. And here's some example code that shows just how easy this is. Uh, there's really three things to keep in mind here. First, we're just kind of loading in a, you know, a standard uh, Python module here. We're extending a class, command handler in this case. Uh, we're going in, we're uh, defining, a, uh, we're overriding an existing function called unhandle command. And this runs anytime we just type gibberish in. Uh, this will respond. And if we type something that, that really matters, we'll run this method called text message. And in here, you know, if you've written some Python, you'll notice this is kind of standard Python stuff here. We've got a, a, a familiar dispatch pattern there in the text message method that will go out and, and run the magic eight function, if that's what it calls for. I guess I should have added the, the bribe code in there. But, um, We've got uh, some, some decorators here. We have the, the auth required decorator. Uh, this is just something we wrote. And it, let me talk about that a minute. Uh, we obviously want Glinda to respond to humans, right? We don't want Glinda responding to people. She shouldn't be responding to people that are you know, trying to get information. So uh, because of this very nice abstraction App Engine provides, we're able to do n number of validation checks on the sender of the message. So we can go and you know, check perhaps, uh, you know, are they a member of our Google Apps domain? Do they exist in our corporate directory? You know, there's a bunch of things we could do. In this case, we, you know, we do a lot of those checks. We also go and we use other services of App Engine to actually send an email to that user, make sure that they receive the email, click a link, we record that in the data store, we check that on every request. Uh, you know, these are things that you can do to just validate that the user is you know, someone that should be receiving these messages. Um, another thing I want to point out that, that App Engine gives us is the whole idea here is we want this to spread virally, right? We want it to be fun. And uh, the downside to doing that is there's a good chance we're going to go from you know, 100 requests a day to, I don't know, 10,000. And when we do that, you know, it's good to know that App Engine is behind the scenes and can dynamically scale and, and support that kind of load. Um, and you know, to get us those, those 10,000 uh, uh, users, uh, Adam's gonna come back and talk about an application that helps people get started using Google Apps. Thanks, Matt. Sure. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that we were in the middle of our migration of users to Gmail. Um, at Genentech, uh, another great thing about working there is that we do provide a very high level of support um, to our end users and for our Gmail migration it's no different. Uh, we have decided to form a group of people who are dedicated to providing one-on-one -on -one support. You can call them up, uh, you can schedule them to come to your desk, you can schedule group training, you can schedule WebEx sessions, however you want to get support for you as you're going through the migration period, we're available to help. And so. When we formed this group, we realized early on that one of the challenges that we had was how do we manage all of these appointments that are going to be coming in from the 17,000 people that are going to be migrating over. So at that point, we, we had a choice that we could make. We could either hire a coordinator that managed eight people's schedules and scheduling all of the meetings in Google Calendar, or we could approach this problem from a technical perspective and see if we could find a technical solution. And that's exactly what we did uh, with Aperio and the, the Google Apps Concierge tool. So the Google Apps Concierge tool from, again, a very high level, takes an X number of calendars for individual people and then aggregates it down into one view that's presented to the end user that you can then book a time with one of the concierges. Then on the concierge side, it allows, it books the time automatically in whoever's calendar is free for that time slot, and then notifies them of the upcoming appointment. Um, this has been a great, this has actually been a great tool for us because it gives our end users the ability to control when they want to receive support, makes it very easy for them, and, uh, and gives, uh, gives them the opportunity to get the, the, get the support that they need as they're going through. So I'll turn it over to Matt again, look at the back end.
Let's see if I can shrink this down a little bit. Okay, so uh, this is the application. You'll see this looks very much like a, you know, a very simple web app. It looks modern, it has the rounded corners and, and all the things you would expect. Uh, the idea here is that this should be you know, extremely simple, kind of one click, get access to a concierge, book your appointment, get the help you need, and, and get on with your day job. And you know, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time walking through this just because there's not much to it. You click a button, you type in your information, and, and you're done. Uh, so let me go back to the slides and, and show how this works behind the scenes. Um, as you can tell by the image here, this is App Engine again, except this time it's the Java runtime. And specifically here, here's some code from there. And you know, I, I was going to ask the, the audience here uh, what's interesting about it. And looking at that, I think the answer is there's nothing interesting about that code, uh, nothing at all. Uh, and I think oftentimes, you know, we, we overlook the fact at a conference like this or when, you know, we're getting blasted with all this new technology that if we have skills that we've acquired and mastered over 10 or 15 years, like doing HTML and JSP pages, we don't have to learn a lot of new stuff. We can, you know, take that and immediately begin and start using it. Uh, and that's exactly what we had here. We had, a, you know, experienced designers. We have people that are used to looking at, at these tags in, in their HTML. We have people that knew JSP. And, and they could begin and use those skills on App Engine without having to learn GWT, although that would have probably been a lot more interesting. Um, another thing to point out here is they didn't even really have to learn a lot of data store stuff for this application. And the reason is because Genentech, like a lot of enterprises, has invested in their enterprise service bus infrastructure, and we were able to just reuse that investment uh, from App Engine. Here we are using the you know, same um, uh, Java classes that, that people are familiar with to do HTTP communication, and that's exactly what we're doing here. We're getting JSON back from their ESB that actually would be an interesting talk in and of itself. It talks out to Google Calendar and a lot of other systems in order to check calendar availability and book, uh, book calendar appointments. But you know, that's all there is to it, and I think that the whole point here is that uh, Although, as developers, we all wish we could learn new stuff every day, you know, a lot of times it's, it's, not, it's not realistic. It's not the right thing to do. So if you already have those skills that you've learned over 15 years, feel free to bring them to bear in App Engine. Adam? Okay, so um, just to extrapolate a little further on Matt's comment around our investment in our enterprise service bus architecture. So, in general, when we are um, implementing on the uh, Google platform, we do try and implement or tie into Google's APIs uh, with our enterprise service bus and then expose those as web services. And that gives us a couple of advantages uh, from, a, from a couple of different perspectives because then we can reuse those services. So some of the same services that we developed for um, Glinda it were reused in uh, the co migration concierge or the concierge app as well, and we're seeing that throughout the enterprise as, as uh, both recognition of the platform's capabilities grow, and then as as people are starting to pick up and do more implementations on it. So this next uh, this next integration is is one of the more interesting ones that we've done over the course of the last year for a couple of different reasons. So I mentioned earlier that one of the goals of our team is to give time back to our employees to make sure that they're focused on the work that they're there to do and make, make their jobs easier. Um, so at Genentech, we, we obviously use Google Apps. We also use Salesforce.com. So we've got you know, two major pieces of our, of our infrastructure in the cloud. And one of the pieces of feedback that we got from our Salesforce, our commercial organization, was that they're having to manage too many calendars. So day in the life of, if I'm a salesperson, I've got to go wake up in the morning, look at my personal Google Calendar, check my meetings and appointments there with my colleagues at work, then uh, you know, you've got team calendars in addition to that that have all kinds of events that, that people are managing, so you've got to check that. And then you've got to switch over again to salesforce.com and then look at your Salesforce calendar and figure out what are my appointments with doctors and with healthcare professionals and so on and so forth. So, so our sales folks are managing three uh, possibly even you know, up to 10 different calendars to figure out what they needed to do in their day. So big problem. Um, 
with the unified calendar, what we were able to do was, because of the open standards and open nature of both Salesforce and Google, is take Salesforce, the calendar in Salesforce, and bring it in and funnel it down into one view in Google Calendar. So now our Salesforce team has one place to go. All of their appointments show in one, in one screen, and then they also have the ability to manage their events and subscribe to events that they're interested in, like educational series about new drugs or new ways to present information to doctors uh, you know, based on FDA regulation and so on and so forth. So I'll hand it back to Matt again. As you might guess, now I'm going to give a demo. OK, so uh, like Adam said, this, is, this was a very, uh, uh, very big application. And uh, we could easily spend eight hours going into the, the nuts and bolts of how this whole thing worked. And anyone, anyone that's done calendar synchronization knows what I'm talking about. Uh, so what I'm going to focus on today is just one, just one part of this, and, and it's the piece that I think is uh, that most applies to the audience here, and, and that is this Google gadget over here on the right. Um, and in order to kind of explain what we should be looking at here, let me talk a little bit about more, a little bit about the business case. Um, as a user of, of Google Calendar here, I'm going to have a, you know a lot of appointments every day, right? Some of these are are personal appointments, some of them are meetings people have booked with me, uh, but others live in Salesforce. The, the system of record of those lives in Salesforce, and then those are behind the scenes synchronized and they show up on my calendar. And uh, these are what we call interactions, and an inter in interaction in this case is, is just you know, a, a meeting uh, with someone in the medical industry about a Genentech product or a Genentech event or something like that. So we have a couple of those here. You can see I've got one at, uh, at noon today, or I had one at noon today. I've got another one at 5 today. And uh, these are calls with people. And once again, these live in Salesforce. This is where they were created. And then magically, they were pushed through the Enterprise Service Bus uh, right here to my calendar. So what we have is this gadget. And what it does is it shows all of the interactions, all of those special events that are on my calendar that are visible right now. You can see there's two, so there's two showing up right here. Um, let me go to, um, let's just go to the week view. So now I'm seeing more of my calendar and, and the interactions load up, and now I'm looking at, at three different interactions because I can see three, the, the two that are today and, and the one at 1 p.m. tomorrow. So when I use this gadget, the idea is that I can click directly from my Google Calendar and go back to Salesforce to look at interesting things about the interaction. I can look at the account. I can look at the interaction itself. Uh, I'm not going to go through that right now. I'm just going to focus on the gadget. Um, the other thing you'll notice is I have a second calendar over here called Commercial Events. And these are events that I personally find interesting. I go into Salesforce. I, I uh, select a bunch of criteria, things that are interesting to me, and then out of potentially thousands of events, Salesforce will figure out uh, the events that interest me, and it'll push them to this special calendar that's, that's unique to me. Um, and whenever this calendar is visible, I have a link at the bottom of the gadget that says, edit my commercial event preferences. And this is where I would go in and say, OK, you know, I'm only interested in events related to this particular product or that product or something like that. Uh, one thing that I want to point out that's important when you're designing a gadget is that uh, there's limited screen real estate here. So if I'm not viewing that calendar, uh, if you'll pay attention to the gadget, when I deselect that, uh, hopefully, the gadget should respond and, and hide that, exactly like it's not doing. <laughs> so imagine a nice fade of that, that disappearing. Uh, let, let's try that again. Ah, there we go. OK, so um, and that's just something to keep in mind when you're writing gadgets is you know, respect the user's screen real estate. There's not a lot there. They may have other gadgets. If you're hogging all the space, they're going to get rid of your gadget. So, so keep that in mind. OK, let me switch over to some code. Um, before I show the code, though, let me just emphasize, this is, this is kind of a merger of equals, this application here. It's kind of equal part Salesforce. Uh, being the system of record, equal part Google, 
being the, uh, the user interface, and then equal part all the glue that makes it work, and that, that's the enterprise service bus. All right, the first little code snippet I want to talk about is really what orchestrates the entire gadget. And uh, this is the, uh, the standard kind of calendar sidebar API that you use. This is all JavaScript. Uh, and what we're doing here is, is anytime the user changes the visible number of events they're seeing, you know, if they're looking at day and they go to week view like I did, then this subscribe to dates function is going to run. It's going to run our callback, in this case, got dates, and this starts the gadget. Okay, so now that now we have the dates, now we need to go and ask Google to get us all of the events for that date range. And this is an important pattern you'll see. Uh, it's not as well documented as, as I think uh, it should be, but it's something that once you get the hang of it, it really makes writing gadgets easier. And that is uh, always assume that the user isn't authorized. So we're going to go and we're going to ask Google, say, hey, give me a bunch of events. Most people would say, well, before we do that, we need to authorize the user, make sure they have access to these events. Uh, but it turns out that's, that's actually not the best way to do it, because we're using three-legged OAuth here, and the user could revoke the token at any time. We're not guaranteed this is going to succeed. So let's just go ahead and try to get it anyway. And um, if you haven't seen you know, code like this, asynchronous uh, JavaScript like this, the way to read it is to just start at the bottom. We're going to ask the calendar, give us all the events. That's either going to succeed or, it, or it's going to fail. If it succeeds, great. We got the events, run the display event function uh, or method right here. If it failed, and it failed because we weren't authorized, then run this fictitious method here that I, that I, that I put in just to uh, make it so there's less code on the screen here called authorize me. And this would do the normal OAuth dance and ask, you know, which account do you want to use to authorize and all that stuff. Uh, this code actually uses the, uh, the shindig library from, from Apache to, to automate all this stuff. It's, it's really clean. And after we do that, then we just call the same method again. Uh, and this kind of very simple recursion makes authorization with OAuth very, very easy. Okay, so now we've got events, we're authorized, or excuse me, we've gotten an event feed from Google, we're authorized. Uh, now let's display the events on the screen. And to do that, we need to identify out of potentially hundreds of events that were returned, which ones are interactions. And sure, we could do that by looking at the subject and trying to say, well, if the subject looks this way, then it's probably an event that was pushed from Salesforce. But the user could always change the subject, uh, and that would lead to a, you know, a bug down the road. And so that's not the right thing to do. Uh, so instead, we use something that's often overlooked, and, and it's uh, extended properties. And this is a standard feature of the calendar API. Any event can have arbitrary name value pairs attached to it, and that's what we do here. So whenever Salesforce, through the ESB, creates these events, we add a bunch of extended properties to it. The user has no idea those are there. They can't change them, but we, the programmer, can, and we can look at them. So that's what we do here. Uh, we just loop through every event in the feed. If it has certain extended properties, then we know it came from Salesforce. We know it's an interaction. We know we should display it in the gadget. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it leave back to Mike, and he's going to talk more about some gadget work. Excellent. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Adam. Super. Yeah, that's great. Let's hope that uh, Magic 8-Ball predicted accurately in this last demo um, works smoothly. We'll find out. So imagine, if you will, what it would be like to run your entire business in the cloud. Gartner tells us that one out of five companies 20% of the companies are going to do this. They're going to be serverless by the year 2012. Now, Period doesn't only do this for our customers. We actually do it for ourselves. That's how we run our business. And now with Gmail contextual gadgets and a new product from Aperio called PS Connect, you can do all of that directly within Google Apps. Let me show you how. So for this demo, let's assume I run our services organization. And to do so, I need a lot of powerful enterprise applications. Okay. I need to be able to manage my people, my projects, my customers, my financials. And to do so, I need a, 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 lot, of, a lot of powerful apps. And I use uh, apps that are all in the cloud. I use uh, salesforce.com to manage my leads and my opportunities. I use a force.com application called PS Enterprise to manage my projects and my resources. So you can see I've got a lot of information out here, right? It's all necessary to run my business. But unfortunately, this isn't where I spend my day. Okay, this is. 
Okay, this is where I make dozens and dozens of decisions throughout the day that affect my operations, but I do so without the benefit of all that information that's locked up in the cloud. Okay? But now with, again, with Gmail contextual gadgets and PS Connect, I can do that within my email. Let me show you how I do that. So when I start my day, I typically will zero in on customer-related emails. Here's one from Carl Customer. This one uh, looks like Carl wants to go to lunch. Well, you know, I'm typically not going to prioritize this. It doesn't seem very urgent. I'm certainly not going to go out to my CRM system and see what kind of projects and what kind of opportunities uh, we have open with this particular customer. But you know what? That would be a mistake, okay? Because look down here. At the bottom of this email is a new Gmail contextual gadget called PS Connect that's gone out to my enterprise applications and gathered all the re relevant information and displayed it to me here. So, of course, I've got contact information and such, but look, I've got seven opportunities uh, in my CRM system open with this particular customer, and one of them here happens to be related to this particular email. It's the office relocation, okay, which happens to be on hold, but guess what? I just learned from this particular email that the New York office move is complete, so I can now take action directly from with this, within this email. I can cha change the stage from prospecting to qualified, and that automatically gets updated. I can add this record to my CRM system so the entire account team can see what's going on. And I typically wouldn't have done either of those two things until the night before uh, the sales call. But because I've now done them and I've informed my sales team what's going on, I can go ahead and appropriately respond to this customer and say, sounds great. You know, looking forward to lunch next week. Okay. So far, so good. So I'm going to go back to my inbox and look at the next email. Is he impatient? All right, this is from a customer that doesn't look to be too happy. It looks like his project is, uh, is off track. Um, now, typically, this would uh, just set off a flurry of activity in my company. You know, it's whose project is this? What's the status? What are we doing about it? One big fire drill, right? But you know what? All of this information is probably within my PS Enterprise system. And PS Connect has brought that information back to me here. So I can see this customer happens to have three projects open. Two of them are in red, uh, two of them are in green status. One of them happens to be in red. That's probably the one he's talking about here, implementation. I see a note from the project manager that says the schedule will slip unless an architect is extended. So you know what, I'm familiar enough with my project, uh, with the staffing situation, that I can go ahead and, and, and extend a resource. But you know what, is that a smart thing to do? Additionally, I have more information here that says this project has plenty of budget left. I've got over $600,000, so you know what? I'm gonna go ahead and inform my staffing team that uh, we're extending this resource, and I'm gonna respond to Scott to say, hey, the, the resource has been extended, and he's gonna be thrilled. So you can see by running your entire business in the cloud, it's a vastly different experience, right? You have the ability to go out to your enterprise systems, aggregate all that information, and display it directly within uh, Google Apps. Again, thanks to Gmail contextual gadgets and PS Connect. Okay, so that is the end of our demos. I want to transition back over to here and open it up to Q&A. We obviously talked about uh, three uh, gadgets, three demos that we developed uh, at Genentech, um, uh, uh, and the one here developed by Aperio, and I want to open up to questions uh, for any of those. There must be some questions. Well, you can ask some tough ones. There are developers and engineers in the room from both Aperio and Genentech who uh, have worked on some of these projects. If you just, just step up to the microphone so everybody can hear you. So uh, what's next? What do you have in mind as far as the next enterprise applications that you could build on top of Google Apps using the APIs and utilize within Genentech or Aperio? Yeah, great question. So. You know, we see uh, tons of opportunities to continue to move functionality to, uh, to the cloud. Google continues to offer richer and richer APIs that makes that possible. Um, you know, anything that you see uh, happening behind the firewall today, um, whether it's, uh, you know, single sign-on or directory services as, as examples, um, those are things that could be taken out to the cloud and become part of uh, not your... Uh, your network behind the firewall, but your network uh, in the cloud. And we see Google continuing to make advances in those areas to make things like that possible. And I can add, actually add a little bit to that. So some of uh, what Genentech is looking at as well. So I mentioned 
um, trying to keep people, as, as Mike has talked about as well, trying to keep people in one interface, um, see, there's a lot of benefit there. So, you know, looking at the contextual gadgets, there's a lot of opportunity in that area specifically to integrate with some of the, you know, legacy systems that we have. So, for example, um, you know, you look at SAP and you get, you know, email notifications for invoice approvals or for, you know, payment processing, whatever it is, there's a lot of opportunity there to keep people from having to jump over into SAP, log in, do the transaction, and then come back to the email message. You could actually implement that within the contextual gadget as well. So those are some of the things that we're thinking about too. Hey guys, thanks for your time. Uh, two, two part question, how do you see these approaches integrating with other social and collaboration portals like Wave? And also, how do you see them fitting in with other enterprise portal frameworks like LifeRate? Uh, sorry, I missed the second question. How, how do you see these kinds of integration approaches working with other enterprise portal frameworks like LifeRay or Oracle Portal or SharePoint or, you know, pick a flavor? Do you, is there an integration path? Is there any strategy behind it? Has, has anyone thought that in that direction yet? Yeah, yeah well, I, <coughs> I guess I, I can answer the second part of the question. Uh, generally, I'm not familiar with, with a lot of those products, but uh, you know, what we have tried to do at, at Genentech as well, and, and, and really everywhere, is push the open standard. So uh, you know, use OpenID, use three-legged OAuth, use, you know, use these things, and then hopefully, all the vendors that typically do things in a proprietary fashion, they're gonna gradually trend to do things in more of a standards way, and, and the investments we make in these standards will continue to work. Would um, you, just to, to extend that statement, I mean, would you consider portlet standards like GSR 268 as being part of that family or not part of that family? Uh, I'm not familiar enough with it to answer that, but uh, it sounds like it's a standard. <laughs> And I'll try to answer the first part of that. Regarding WAVE, um, obviously we've all been using WAVE for the last uh, year. Um, we've used it um, in the in consultant environment with a number of customers, um, and we're aware that it was coming to Google Apps, uh, obviously for some time now, thrilled with the announcement this morning. And we're looking forward to using it out in the field. Um, Project-based sort of collaborative communication work is where we've seen the, the best usage of it. In terms of expanding upon that, um, still early stage, Certainly, we'll see opportunities Thank there. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, for Genentech, how do you feel that um, like Google's meeting your compliance needs with like respect to HIPAA and GMP for the software you have to develop? I mean, can they do they make your compliance people happy with the security they provide and the software testing and so on? So, in general, yes. Um, within Genentech, there's a pretty distinct line drawn between. Um, you know, validated, the validated world, so to speak, GMP, GCP, GLP. Um, so the, for those of you who don't know in the audience, this is like FDA regulation speak um, for systems that have to deal with drug manufacturing. So, uh, you know, there's a very distinct line be drawn, that's drawn between the two. Um, we have gone through a particular exercise with one of our integrations between SAP and Google and have uh, had pretty good success with that particular instance and getting qualities buy off on, um, you know, the security model, um, the, the data center, down to the data center security um, uh, as well. So, um, you know, I think there's some opportunity there. It is a little more difficult um, just because of the nature of what you're dealing with in the regulated environment. But yeah, they seem generally pretty pleased as long as we don't cross the line too much, so. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, you were obviously using something before Google Apps, so what was that, and what were the challenges moving the users from wherever you were to over to Google Apps, and what kinds of things should we look out for? Sure, uh, good question. Um, so before Google Apps, uh, we were using um, Oracle Calendar, and for our calendaring system, and the reason we were using Oracle Calendar, like I said before, is because we needed that broad platform support and supporting both Macs and PCs and mobile devices. Um, and then for our email solution where we were and still are for some people that haven't migrated yet using SendMail as the infrastructure. Um, so the, the migration from Oracle Calendar to uh, 
Google Calendar was a cut, was a cutover event, so we did it with Aperio actually um, over a weekend. Migrated everyone's data. They got to work on Monday morning, and they were on Google Calendar. That was a largely successful, extremely successful successful implementation that, uh, in many ways, kind of set the standard for how Google Apps migrations have gone forward after that. Um, our email migration, just because of the the complexity that we uh, that we have. Uh, we don't limit our users' mailboxes sizes at Genentech. Uh, so we have a lot of people with a lot of large mailboxes. Some people have been there for 30 years, you know, so on and so forth. So uh, that's a little more complex because of the amount of data that we're dealing with. So we have to migrate them in uh, a different way. It's not a cutover event. It's a 800 people every other week kind of type thing. And it's actually going very well for us so far. Explain a little bit more about your PS Connect. Is there something like Gmail, and you can see the advertising is related to your, you know, mail, something like that? I mean, the, the how how the PS Connect work? I mean, so PS Connect uh, is a Gmail contextual gadget mm -hmm. that uses a Force.com application at the back end to integrate behind the scenes called PS Enterprise and it's extracting data out of that, this force.com application, and displaying it in an intelligent way based on the sender of the email, the receiver of the email, or the content of oh, the, the email. Con you search the con you know, every yes. word content. Okay. Correct. Yep. Any other questions? Uh, now you have in integrating uh, this uh, ESP and uh, Google app, is that an a big problem, or how's the infrastructure behind that? Yeah, so uh, so it, it's actually extremely simple. So the, the infrastructure uh, from the Google, from my perspective, is so let's say if I was programming an app engine, uh, it's very simple. I can just send a, a HTTP request to a URL, and it's going to give me JSON or give me whatever I want, give me XML and then I just uh, consume that like I would any data source. So uh, from that perspective, it, it's very simple. Um, you know, it, it's obviously a little bit more complex behind the scenes. A lot of the calendar, I, I would suspect, although I didn't write this code, but a lot of the calendar uh, API interaction that's happening in the ESB is, is probably abstracting a lot of, you know, G data calendar calls, right? Getting event feeds, searching those feeds, and doing those kinds of things. And, you know, that's done in Java in the Enterprise Service Bus. Okay. Thanks. Hi. Hey, thanks again for the presentation. I really appreciate that. Um, I noticed in most of the client examples that you gave were all through the, the web interface, now using the Gmail interface. And I was curious if you. So allow users to use, say, a desktop client of their preference, say maybe you have users who like Microsoft Outlook or Apple Mail, and if you do, I'm curious to see how your, uh, if, the, if that works, how well that's working for you. Sure. Good question. Um, so the strategy that we, uh, that we employ or empl are employing for our deployment is to move people to the web interface first. Um, we have done some pretty in-depth analysis on uh, what, are the, what are the issues that people run into with, uh, with email. Is it the client? Is it problems with the client, the thick client? Is it problems with the back-end mail server? Um, and so on and so forth. So what we found is that uh, based on a pilot that we ran for about a year, we find that people end up, after they get over the initial hump of adjusting to the web interface and go through the change, get the right training, get the right support, that they end up having fewer problems in the web interface than what they had in the Outlook and Apple Mail interface. So we do allow people to make the choice uh, for the most part. Um, we go first to the web UI, and then if you just you know you can't live in it or you have a business reason for needing the Apple Mail or Outlook client, then we'll give it to you. We're not going to restrict you, but we do encourage people to go that way first, and we train to that and provide uh, change management support to that as well. Uh, you, you mentioned real estate as being a concern in the Gmail uh, interface. Do you have any provisions in place for changes that Google might make to the interface? And um, is there any way to know ahead of time where your box might get eliminated by a new box? Yeah, that's a really good question. So uh, 
uh, one of the, the benefits of, of uh, using uh, Google Apps is that it's always changing, right? It seems like features come out every day. And uh, certainly, uh, Google could release a feature that could impact a particular user interface we were going for. Uh, but uh, the good thing is that these things happen slowly. So usually it's not as if uh, you know, the entire sidebar is going to go away one day. At Google, if they were going to do that, in my experience, you know, they would communicate a change of that size. Uh, but, I, you know, and I'm interested to get your perspective on this, Adam. Uh, I think that enterprises probably are a bit scared of that kind of rapid pace of innovation when they start. But I really think users are, are familiar with it because so many people use Gmail every day. You know, it, it, this kind of thing doesn't really bother people, I think. Uh, uh, and I think that as users begin using Google Apps in the enterprise, these small changes they'll see as, as uh, good things, right? Not as, oh my gosh, you're, you're breaking something. Uh, is that kind of yeah, what you've seen? Absolutely. So uh, in the beginning, when we first uh, moved to, from Oracle Calendar to Google Calendar, there was a shock period for people, especially whenever new changes would come up. We'd get tons of calls to our service desk um, asking you, what is this? you know, how do I use it, and so on and so forth. And what we've seen over time is that people gradually adjust. They go back to that, they, they go back to that mentality of, oh yeah, it's just, it's just Gmail, it's just Google Calendar, and this is kind of the way things work with it, so. Uh, this is for Genentech question. Uh, you mentioned primary data associated with corporate information, like user accounts and so forth. Uh, in pharma, there is a, a big component, which is the scientific data. Um, do you perceive issues related to migrating some of the scientific information, uh, particularly the computational aspect running on the App Engine? Uh, have you seen any requests from that space? So, uh, no, not necessarily. We don't really see a security risk um, in having that data hosted. I think that's, is that the question you're yeah, asking? That, that's one aspect also. Okay. Be, you know, yeah. Uh, it's so a regulated environment, as you know, so. Uh, sure. There must be some. Uh, sure. Okay. So about this. there's there's not really we don't really see a risk in in migrating data out, um, scientific research data, uh, things of that sort. Um, the security that Google Apps is able to provide, uh, for the most part, at least meets and in many places exceeds the security that we're able to provide mm -hmm. in terms of how it's implemented. Um, I was more like concerned about the lawyers aspect, <laughs> not the oh, technical the lawyers aspect. aspect. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, it did take some work uh, to get to the point where uh, our lawyers were comfortable with us storing information in the cloud. Um, they did get to the, it took about a, I think I showed the slide of the timeline uh, where we spent time evaluating what the platform was. I would say about 90% uh, of that time was, was time with lawyers, getting them familiar, having them converse with Google's lawyers to understand exactly what the, uh, you know, what the, what the use cases are, what the possibilities are. Um, and then for the most part, there's only one particular area where we found a gap, and it has to do with data privacy protection laws when you get into a very specific kind of lawsuit. And that's basically it. That's what it boiled down to. But, uh, you know, it does take some time if you're looking at it uh, with your corporate lawyers. It takes time to get them comfortable with it. Continuing the lawyer discussion, um, can you touch on how you're um, dealing with discovery for legal holds, and also um, coming from the education space where we deal with HIPAA and FERPA a lot, um, is it possible or have you already published sort of a generic thing of like, Genentech thinks this is cool and we're okay with it and therefore you should feel less um, scared of it? Um, so actually, I'm not sure I understood the last part of your question. So is there just a general announcement of Genentech has done this and we are okay. fine with the HIPAA implications of going this way. Okay, um, so in terms of e-discovery and legal holds, we have implemented a custom solution for that that integrates with our, with our on-premise e-discovery uh, e discovery system. So uh, because of the API access that we have um, through, the, uh, through the supervision APIs, we're able to get uh, people's mailboxes. Um, and then we also have implemented uh, retention policy within Gmail so that, you know, email is cleaned at a certain time period, there are certain labels that you can apply that will uh, circumvent the, the janitoring. Uh, there's a legal hold label and there's a save uh, type of label that we use at uh, Genentech as well. 
No, we're not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, go ahead. What's that? Oh, why not Postini? Okay, that's a complex, a simple question, a very complex answer. <laughs> so uh, we have, uh, at Genentech, we have a pretty substantial um, MTA infrastructure that we use to handle our mail routing. And uh, there's a lot of history behind why we do things a certain way to keep uh, email with, within the, the bounds of Genentech, um, so to speak. So a lot of it has to do with that. The, the MTA infrastructure that we've implemented is kind of a legacy system. Um, it's got a lot of uh, very complex routing rules and, and things that are there that we weren't able to uh, port over to Postini just yet. So. I wanted to ask a little bit more about the HIPAA piece because I'm not sure how much you're affected by that or not in your company. So handling patient data, I mean, it seems to me the biggest issue is the business associate agreement that has to happen as part of the chain from patient to people who are managing in the middle. Did you handle that and how was your relationship to Google in terms of you signing one and then the next person in the chain of custody, if you don't mind? Sure. So all of our confidential patient and HIPAA information is stored in other systems. So uh, it's policy in general within Genentech that we don't uh, communicate this type of information across email to begin with. It's all held within certain systems. Um, communication is handled from there. So that's, that's, I don't know if that answers your question regarding HIPAA compliance, but that's, that's how we do it at Genentech. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, then I, I think we're gonna wrap up just a few minutes early. Hopefully uh, that was uh, both interesting and educational. Maybe it gave you some ideas of things that you can do within your companies or things you can do with your customers. Uh, we'd also invite you to uh, come visit us uh, in the Enterprise Pavilion at the Aperio booth. Thank you very much.